Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Super psyched to have you here for the Dragon Innovation Roomba Teardown. Um, for the folks that have been here before, um, as you know, we like to keep it super casual. So please, it's a lot more interesting if you jump in with questions rather than just having me go on. Um, I'll just give you a quick overview of, of Dragon. A lot of you know what we're up to, but basically we are a bunch of former iRobot um, folks that built the first four million Roombas. I had the chance to live over in Asia for four of those years, building about 40,000 Roombas a week, and really uh, had the first-hand opportunity to see what it's like to go from an idea all the way through high-volume manufacturing. And these were the days before Dragon existed, or we were sort of in our Dragon diapers. There's nobody to help us. So we lived everything the hard way. And uh, it's amazing to see how far things have come in the last 15 years, you know, with the ability with 3D printing and Arduino and GrabCAD and Kickstarter and all these amazing tools to be able to get to our prototype more quickly. But it's still pretty hard to scale up from one to many. And what we're focused on at Dragon is really greatly simplifying and de-risking the whole manufacturing process. So you can focus on engineering and marketing and really growing your company and just know that the manufacturing is going to be done right. So in effect, we act like an API for manufacturing and work with amazing um, contract manufacturers in the US and then overseas in China. So the first Roomba we sold was 200 bucks. And I, I, um, if you do the rough math, we always talk about a rule of four. That means the hard cost or cost of goods should have been about, 20, uh, about 50 bucks. So thinking about how do you build a five degree of freedom robot for 50 bucks is pretty insane. Um, but keeping in mind, um, maybe it's a side of um, you know, consumer electronics price points and also being able to hit the quality and the schedule um, is, is super important. Um, we'd also think about um, in a sense, navigation, or you know, what's the pattern you use to, to clean? Yeah, I would put that under um, cleaning and mobility. Cool. Okay, yeah, I'll put that under power. Overall. Okay, um, yeah, it's sort of the structure. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's a great list to get started. I mean, when we look at it, the key things are people are buying this thing to clean their floor, so it's got to clean, um, and you should never, or one should never lose sight of that, and it's often easy to get excited about other things, but at the end of the day, it's got to clean, and to clean, it has to have mobility, so if it gets stuck, it's not cleaning and it failed. And every home is totally different. Like, there's not a canonical home. Um, your home is different from my home, which is different from your home. Um, and you're also operating in a, in a dirty environment, which is really tough um, to you know, not have things fall apart. So it's certainly an uh, incredibly ambitious project. And it's something where if we knew what we knew now, we never would have attempted it. Um, it's like an insanely hard um, problem. But fortunately, we were young. and we went for it and it, it paid off. In fact, I think something like 80% of iRobot's revenue and their close to a billion dollar market cap comes from product, the Roomba. So it's, um, you should definitely go for it and don't listen to old, old farts saying it's too hard. So yeah, so we built this thing, we did a focus group, which uh, was the only useful focus group I've really seen. And we had it run around and ask people, you know, what would you pay for it? And it's like, well, we'll pay about 200 bucks. And um, we said, well, you know, it doesn't have a vacuum in it. Um, is that okay? And, and the cleaning was fine. It's like, oh, no, if it doesn't have a vacuum, I'm only going to pay 100 bucks. And we're like, you mean you'd pay an extra 100 bucks for the same cleaning if it had a vacuum? They're like, yeah. It's like, okay. So we ended up, uh, Elliot Mack, the amazing mechanical engineer that did this, literally shoehorned a vacuum in there in, in a weekend. And this is a, more, this is a fourth generation Roomba. But if you look at the first one, you'll see that it's only half a cleaning, um, the cleaning bin is only you know, two thirds of the length, and then there's this vacuum which actually doesn't work terribly, but it really does, it's like 5% of the cleaning. Uh, and that was all, let us charge 200 bucks instead of 100 bucks. You know, being engineers, we are super practical. It's like the vacuum doesn't do anything, it takes a lot of power, we're not doing it. Um, but on the marketing side, it's like, wow, we, we actually can not survive if we don't have it. So that got shoved in there. So what we ended up doing there is, um, trying to figure out the filter, because anytime you have a vacuum, you need a filter. So this one has this sort of secret hidden compartment with the filter here. And you can tell it's a real room, but it's got some miles on it. Um, 
what we decided to do due to packaging is do what's called a dirty vac, where you actually are sucking the debris through the impeller, which we thought, oh, that's never going to work. That's going to get jammed up. But it worked beautifully. It never, never got jammed. Um, so there's always a little bit of luck in there. Um, we realized also that if we didn't make the squeegee um, that you could separate it, it would get clogged up with fuzz very quickly and not work. So with this design, as you pull out the filter, it separates the squeegee and then all the debris falls right out. So it's um, worked out well. The filter's replaceable. The challenge here from a UI standpoint is that it's kind of a hidden compartment, which is why you see all, we call this tampo, all these instructions everywhere. So the first Roombas were incredibly heavily tattooed, just instructions everywhere and do this, don't do that. Um, but it actually, the vacuum worked and it worked out. The challenge we saw though, in this one, oh, and this one's a little newer, um, so it doesn't have it, but we're, our cleaning performance went down and we weren't sure why this was happening, so we had all these glass bottom tables and everybody was under the table kind of watching the robot drive on top with video cameras and things and even video cameras in the bin. And what we found is that the um, debris would come off the bin at an incredibly high velocity, bounce off the back of the bin, and then get the brush and get put down again. So redeposition was a huge problem. So we ended up putting basically a um, beveled blast shield so that as the debris hit, it would be redirected to the surface, um, dissipate the energy, and then drop in the bin. Um, but that was a huge problem, and again, not something we thought about. And that's also why this um, wedge-shaped piece is in here. Uh, otherwise, it would just bounce off the face and come out again. Um, and th this is one of the newer ones, meaning in the last, I guess I've been gone five years, so maybe in the last 10 years. And it has the bin full sensor, so it actually can detect when the bin is full, which is going on with these things. Why don't we start taking it apart? So the battery, um, there's basically um, 12 cells in here. And this is, this is an older battery, but the newer ones, we used to use plastic to shrink wrap them. The problem is when the shrink wrap gets hot, it can melt and that can create a short. So good batteries always have a cardboard instead of plastic, which is something we learned the hard way. Um, and then with batteries, it's really important that you have vents because if one of the um, cells spontaneously deconstructs, um, it's gonna release a lot of energy quickly. So you wanna make sure there's no gases that can build up, but you have um, all sorts of vents, which is what's going on in here and then a bunch of screws. The new batteries have a bunch more screws just to hold it together, and then it's ultrasonically welded. And then we used a um, thermistor to measure the temperature, so if it got too hot, we'd know something was wrong. And then we also have a PTC, which is uh, basically a resettable fuse in there. And one of the other things that haunted us is you see these flimsy little catches. Um, Elliot designed these in a weekend just because he had to get it done. Um, and it stuck with us for three or four years. And it's not the, like, if you drop the robot, the battery will fall out. It's a, it's a lousy design. Um, and uh, yeah, it's amazing how long it persisted with us. So just thinking through those things carefully because they may be stuck with you for a while. One of the other big challenges we had is a side brush. So as we were talking, because it's round, it can't clean corners and you know you should be able to clean a corner. So we figured, okay, let's stick on a side brush. Um, the challenge with the side brush is that if you've looked at a street cleaner, ideally you'd want a conical brush that's kind of tilted and then it, it drives stuff to the middle. But remembering we have our cliff sensors, that's not going to work because it's going to occlude the, um, the path. So we're like, okay, well, let's go um, to, say, forearms. But the problem there is the arms would get all tied up. Um, and that wasn't going to work. And we also found that as you would drive over a rug, it would really submarine under the rug, and they're stiff enough that it would get stuck. So in this case, two ended up being the optimum number. And then you get all sorts of interesting manufacturing issues, like how do you attach the nylon bristles to the, um, to the flexible part? And you can see we also added ramps here so that it wouldn't, wouldn't get stuck. But it's something as simple as you know a side brush, how hard that can that be? But we spent probably two or three years trying to perfect this. And the newer versions are a lot further along. Um, but it's just amazing how hard, how hard all of this stuff is. Um, but yeah, let's, um, we'll pop off the lid here. In fact, Philip, shall I put you to work here? So yeah, do, um, there's eight screws. And here you can see also some of the, uh, I don't think so. But don't, she's not going back together again. She's a little dirty, but we'll work through it. Um, so what do we see here? Well, we'll start in the bow and work to the stern. Um, 
So here is the, uh, for the virtual wall. So it's basically a 360 degree lens, which is just the geometries molded in with an infrared receiver. Um, so one of the things we wanted is to be able to constrain the robot, that if you were cleaning the kitchen and didn't want it to go in the family room, you could set up effectively an infrared flashlight that was modulated, and then this would detect the beam, and it would act as if it had bumped into something and turn around. Um, there's all this weird optical grease that we had to get to get a good couple in there. So we'd order that from Edmund Scientific and then bring it in and literally dab it on. And when it ran out and we didn't have some, the line shut down. So definitely the less stuff you have, the better. Um, another big challenge was getting this handle to be strong enough to hold the Roomba. Um, then on this side, so this is just the um, inner bumper which holds the cliff detectors. Um, what's kind of cool here, if you can see it, so these are the, let's see if I can get this out of the way. Uh, she's, a, she's got some miles on her. Um, so these are for the bumper um, when it hits, and we've got a left and a right, or a port and a starboard. And when we were doing the math, we thought, you know, why don't we use a mechanical switch? It's kind of a good place to start. But we realized that the robot roughly will hit um, you know, six times a minute, so every 10 seconds. And if you add up the math or multiply it out to get to 200 or 1,000 hours, you realize you're looking at a million or two million bumper hits. And there's very few switches that would do that that we could afford. So we ended up using these optical um, emitter detector pair, which is buried in here, which obviously don't wear out with time. But the challenge is, and you can see that they work well, that despite all this debris in here, there's um, they're self-clearing, so they, they don't get bogged down. I think I may have to take some things off to get to it. Um, but it's pretty, it's pretty cool. You can see there's a little hole in here um, to let the, the debris clear. But all those things, like again, until you work through it, it, it seems a lot easier than it did. What if there's two holes on here? Because they're not symmetrical on the other side. Yeah. These yep, that, that's oh, awesome. So this is also an emitter detector pair buried in here. And what's going on with this is our cleaning algor algorithm, um, which is one of the important things we talked about, is um, we don't do any navigation because we're always worried about systematic neglect, meaning if you could somehow develop, uh, ignoring the cost of it, a perfect map of this room, and I knew where every, ta every chair was and all the table, but then somebody moves the table, I'm going to think the table's in a different spot and I'm never going to clean that area. Um, so we were like, oh, that's not good. So what we ended up doing is our algorithm would do a spiral um, to clean uh, this space, and then we would go into wall following mode. We're basically using the detector you found, Philip. We'd shine a little bit of light on the wall and then look for it, and then snuggle up to the wall so we were close but not touching. And you'll see the Roomba kind of scallop along, and the brush would clean that. Um, but we had a clever algorithm realizing that we might hit an island, so think of like a couch. We didn't want to get dizzy going around that, so we had odometry on the wheels that we'll look at, so we know how far we've gone. And after X amount of time or distance, we'd say, okay, now we're going to do random bounce, and then it would bounce around, and then we'd go to spiral, and then wall following, um, sort of as the core algorithm. But then we had all exception cases, so the classic is the lobster trap, which happens underneath a chair, where the chair legs are just slightly wider than the robot. All the other robots were dumb that they get in there and then befuddled and then if you're not, if you don't have mobility, you're not cleaning. If you're not cleaning, you fail. What we would do is recognize a certain hip pattern and then be like, all right, we're lobster trapped. And then we had some escape behavior that we could go. Same thing with the couch, the saggy couch move um, or, or anything else like that. And part of the way we were able to do it, just bringing it back to the bumpers here, is that with this configuration, if we hit over from here to here, I'm only going to actuate this side because I'm pivoting here. If I hit between here and here, I'm going to actuate a combination of the both of them, and we can measure the time difference between them. And then likewise, from here to here is only going to actuate this side. So with these two sensors, we can tell you know, what zone we're hitting in, and it tells us which way to, which way to turn. Um, so yeah, that's what's going on with the, um, with the bumper. Now with the cleaning head, which I think is the coolest part in here, and let me just see if I can get rid of some of this junk. Don't pay any attention to that. Yeah, I mean, this lets, is sort of an example of how hard 
you know, what a nasty environment it has to work in. Um, okay, so here's our string right here. And what would happen is, as the brush is, here's the brush motor and it's just a um, spur, um, spur gear box to some more spur gears that turns the brush. See the, the brush turning here? As the brushes load up, which would happen when you go on carpet, the whole motor here is going to rotate and it's going to, um, see if I can load up the brushes, and it's literally going to lift the whole cleaning head up. So whenever it gets more torque, it's going to recognize that and lift it up to just the right height. So that through no electronics, through a tenth of a penny piece of string, we've got a, a pretty clever mechanism um, that I think we calculated will servo at a kilohertz, so a thousand times a second, it's perfectly adjusting. And that's how we were able to get the battery life, because without that, there's no so way it would work. The string right there. Here's the string. So yeah, as the... So with a certain amount of tension, it tends to... Uh, just string. It used to be a spring, but we just a string, and it's like a capstan that... So is um, it kind of like a yo-yo effect, or like walking a dog type of... Yes. Thing? Yep. When it loads up, it will just lift itself up exactly the right height, because as it lifts it, the torque, on, or the loading on the motor goes down, and then it will stop doing it. So that's one of the key patents on on this. Um, but the problem we had, um, and again, it's just amazing we survived, uh, is that over time this thing is, you see how dirty it is, it's going to collect um, dust and hair. Mm -hmm. And what that's going to do is load up the bearings and it's going to create torque on the motor. When there's torque in the motor, the cleaning head comes up. When the cleaning head's at the wrong height, it doesn't clean um, and you have a problem. So the initial one, we almost didn't have a way to clean the brushes. And at the last minute, we're like, ah, we should probably make them cleanable which saved us, because if we didn't, we would have gotten 100% returns. Instead, we had a really awkward UI where you had to get a screwdriver in to take it out, and nobody knew about it until we told them. On the new one here, the whole reason that brushes come out is to avoid that problem. And uh, I cleaned these off a little bit, but um, hair was a huge problem. So we had these end caps, and each end cap has a little hole in it, and out of the hole, it will poop hair. So you can see the, um, some hairs coming out there that would have been accumulated here. Without that, it just collects it. Um, so there's all sort of labyrinth seals and other, other things to make that work. Um, the other thing with the brush we noticed is that for some reason, one batch of brushes just weren't cleaning. You're like, wow, oh, what's going on? And after a lot of experimentation and head scratching, we measured the bristles and found that the bristles, you know, say these were uh, 0.01, the new bristles that weren't working are 0.012 just slightly different on the diameter. But I believe the diameter goes, the stiffness goes as the diameter to the fourth. So a small change has a profound, in, small change in diameter has a profound impact on the stiffness. And that was enough to throw it off, but you can't measure it with your eye. So that was a whole quality plan we had to put in place. And also the way the ends are treated, whether they're just sheared off, uh, it, it won't work because there's a barb, they need to be polished. Um, but all things that if you didn't know what to look for, you know, you could risk shipping a product that just wouldn't, wouldn't clean at all. Um, so there's a huge amount of engineering that went into that, which is why um, like hair is, a, is one of the big challenges. And then another one is how do you mold a chevron? Um, so we had an a expanding core um, that you'd find pretty cool, Andrew, um, as a yeah, pretty sweet tool. So this isn't really used for barber shops because hair is it's like hard to shave. We used to, actually with my barber, I used to give it to him and run him around because it's the ultimate test. We actually had what we called the snake pit. So, and it actually was too hard a test, but the trick is, you know, how do you test this thing in reasonable conditions? So we had one test bed that was enclosed with um, tubing and we'd pump out sand and air. So it would spray like a bunch of snakes everywhere. Um, but unfortunately, the Roombas died too quickly and it was just too hard, so it wasn't giving us useful information. But yeah, it's finding the balance of, you know, making sure you're shipping a good product. A little bit more here. And okay, so we'll pull out the cleaning head. cheat a little bit here. There's one wire tie Philip that you need a special tool for. <laughs> All right. Okay. So yeah, cleaning head. Um, here's pretty cool. It's a dirt detect. So we took a piezo um, that was so sensitive you could detect a grain of rice. And basically um, when we detected dirtier areas, we'd spend more time uh, focused on that. 
Um, oh, from the debris going by? It yes, would yep, it would create an acoustic, or it would create a signal, um, and then we, the software would, um, would recognize that. How difficult was the software to write? Oh, incredible. Um, I mean, it was, the challenge is it's a hugely parallel problem, being able to listen to all of the sensors and then respond um, you know, in real time. Because if you think of the cliff detector, yeah. being able to slam it in reverse um, in short order. All right, let's see. OK, ah, this actually isn't that bad. Um, see, here's just a straightforward spur gearbox. Um, but yeah, all these gears are all you know, specially designed. You can see some have bushings, some don't. What we found is originally none of them had bushings, but then the shafts would get hot and literally just chew a long slot. It's like, oh, OK, we should probably put a bushing in there. Um, so just dealing, dealing with things like that. Now let's see if we can, uh, without, doing ch without cutting stuff away. So see if you can see this. But basically, there's some odometry here. So it's a quadrature encoder um, driven, by, uh, um, driven by an O-ring off of a pulley. And then buried inside the hub is a really cool two-stage planetary gearbox. Um, and one of, the reason, one of the ways we thought we were, we were dead is that you can see here's a brass pinion right here. And basically, it's a V. So when they machined it on a lathe, there's a bunch of um, tooling marks. It's not smooth. And at, due to the nature of a V, as it spins, there's going to be scrubbing. So what would happen, um, and, and I should say the reason we use no ring is if the wheel stalls out, it'll just slip. Um, but what happens is it spun, it would create a lot of dust from the, the black rubber. Uh, and there's actually, in the older versions, huge piles of dust, which ordinarily wouldn't be the best thing as long as, but it wouldn't be the worst thing either as long as the um, band didn't break. But what happened is with the optical encoder there, the concern was it would occlude the, um, the path of the, of the beam and then cause the robot to malfunction. So that was one of the workarounds where we ended up putting a plenum of just die cut um, clear plastic to kind of, um, the, the dust would accumulate, but we'd keep it out of the optical path. So that all these sort of late stage workarounds. Um, so let's see if we can pull out the board here for Yeah, I think the problem with magnetic is it would pick up magnetic. It would tend to accumulate. And also the optical, the way it's geared, I want to say we had like a thousand counts. Um, but you just get more counts um, the, way, the way we had it designed. So a little better precision. And let's see. Yeah, I think this board is pretty well. It's pretty well jammed in there. But if you look at it, you can see compared to today, like there's a tremendous number of, um, of through hole components, whereas today it would all be SMT or surface mount. Uh, we designed it so the con uh, connectors are all on top, so you can drop in the board, and then it's easy to connect. Um, but it's a very, you know, very simple, very simple board. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's. Uh, that's probably a good overview. There's always more and more little bits of history in here. Um.